Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to Sid Lal of Canaccord, who runs the Marlborough Multi Cap Income Fund and is one of the UK's finest small and mid cap investors. So, welcome, Sid. Good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, well, my pleasure. And uh, certainly we're starting to see inflation beginning to cool. And hopefully later this week with the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England tomorrow, they'll indicate that they're uh, putting further interest rate um, interest rate increases on, on hold. Um, if that's the case, what's your sort of like outlook for um, equities going forward? Well, valuations are already quite battered and cheap. So interest rates... Uh, cooling, I think, will be a catalyst. That's a given. Um, maybe it's more a question of the timing. So when will you get the first cut? And I think that's probably more likely next year than this year. But you never know. I think sentiment uh, can turn quite quickly, especially in small mid caps. You know, when, when it turns, it's, it's pretty vicious upward and downward. And um, I think we've had the downward, really, quite frankly. It's gone on for a number of months. So maybe it is time to actually start getting a bit positive. Mm. And if we do have a sort of that, that interest rate cup, uh, cut, will that be a, a major positive catalyst for smaller mid caps, which we have seen a lot of liquidity drawn out of the actual, um, you know, the, the UK market? It will depend partly on the rate of decline. So in terms of inflation, how quickly that's falling, the magnitude. But I don't think it will all be in one go. So, you know, yes, data will continue to to evolve and unfold and we have to slightly assume that um, what we're seeing in terms of the official stats are correct i i kind of say this with a little bit of hesitation because you know the september gdp data for instance was revised up and if you look at what happened with the ons data um there was a perception that the uk was the sick man of europe and had not recovered to pre-covid levels and Actually, that was pretty damaging. You know, it's cost the economy billions because it was incorrect. So the sick, sick man of Europe label was completely wrong. Um, in fact, the UK was very much in keeping with its peers for the recovery. And I just hope that the inflation data is right, you know, and, and that the inflation data does get measured properly and at least directionally that, you know, if that continues as a trend, then I think it would be very healthy. But look, one cut will only be um, a question of, this is the beginning of the journey, and then you need more cooling and inflation for there to be another one. So, so you know, it's it's this it's the sequence of events, and I, I don't think anyone's expecting us to go back to a two percent inflation target anytime soon. But the direction is absolutely key, and I think if you believe the stock market has the power to price in uh, future events with a sort of a six month anticipatory uh, gap, then then you know, indeed, you might just find that Q one next year is actually quite exciting. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you. I mean, my portfolio has been totally battered over the last two years, and I'm hoping for sort of better times ahead. That's, for, you know, certainly. So just in one area that uh, has been absolutely hammered is the uh, the house building sector. And in, I think Nationwide came out with surprisingly, actually, month on month increase in house prices of about 0.9% sort of, but overall year on year still down about sort of, you know, 4%. I didn't, you haven't got huge amounts of house builder exposure, but you do own Vistry, which is quite a unique sort of like national builder that i think is now moving into sort of affordable um homes isn't it with the, its ceo the rock star ceo uh, greg fitzgerald yes he's very interesting um i should probably say it's a, it's a much reduced position in history uh partly because they have opted to go for share buybacks over the dividend but that aside um also as a sector it's a much reduced weighting in the portfolio compared with history and that's for obvious reasons if interest rates are high and volume transactions and pricing may well be lower then you know you don't want to be overexposed to that um however in this backdrop with stable interest rates and perhaps mortgage availability just beginning to improve again i say that because actually um while numbers are lower the pricing aspect is very important and i think when you have providers getting clarity on how to price the mortgages then all of those things start to pick up again so um you don't want to be completely out of the sector because, look, you could have taken all of these views into consideration and said, oh, well, there's high interest rates, cost of living crisis, uh, there may well be recession, we're very nervous about all the gearing and everything else, and therefore um, get out of all the house builders. But actually, something like Vistry would, earlier on this year, have been up almost, what, just over 40% at that point. Now, it has cooled more recently, but it's still up 
year on year. And, and you know, so that would have been a very expensive mistake to make, even if you were scared about dividends or anything else. Yeah. Um, sometimes it just shows that actually it's more than in the price. And even when they came out with this news that they want to actually go with a, a big capital return going forward and enter into affordable housing, which, by the way, is a very sensible move for the mix of the business because they're targeting 40% return on capital. Um, well, actually, the shares popped up quite nicely. It was up, up nearly 20% of the day. Now, it may well have cooled for other reasons since then, but it just shows you how there is a lot of value in some of these names. And, you know, maybe you can afford to be a little bit contrarian uh, by holding on until the value comes up. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, and also, even though it's up this year, um, 20%, as you say, it's, it's only on a PE of eight. And I think it trades at around about a 20% discount to net tangible books. So it's right. still priced pretty cheaply, to say the least. Exactly. And a number of the other house builders are in single digit PEs as well. So, yeah. and, and offering good yields. Um, so you kind of get paid to wait in that sector. Yeah. Another one which has sort of got a big discount to net tangible assets, which is in related areas, is Paragon Banking, which does sort of like, you know, buy to let uh, mortgages, but also does sort of commercial lending to uh, to businesses and small companies. I think he's a bit of a challenger to the main four high street banks. Do you want to take us through this one? Because again, and it's as I say, it's trading at five times PE, which just seems frankly mispriced to me. Absolutely. Well, I would say with Paragon, yes, it's a challenger of sorts, but it's also got a very good uh, conservative CEO in, in Nigel. And um, it's sort of business where if you look at the beers, there are other challenges. And, and you know, you, without naming names, if you look at how some of those have sold off, there is a read across, unfortunately. And what, what happens is you look at the differences in account retrieval. Okay, so, so one thing that has happened quite recently is that um, a particular... Uh, smaller bank. Uh, <laughs> can I can I guess which one you're talking about? Metro, by any chance? Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not that one. But 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 you're, oh, you're okay. Another one, maybe. How do you think of it. Um, they had to put through a a treatment for how um, customers behave when they come off a fixed rate mortgage. Okay, and so, so the future value of that cash flow, just to put it very simply, has to be priced effectively today. And, and you have a choice as to whether that should have been spread over a number of months or whether you take it all uh, in, in sort of upfront and in, in one shot. Now, um, shouldn't it really come as a surprise that customer behavior would be very different in a higher interest rate environment? So if you've come off a low fixed rate mortgage, you know, and you're looking at quite an expensive option, you're not going to be hanging around on a variable rate. You want to sort of do something about it. And it's that kind of treatment where I think the maybe the more prudent management teams have acted quickly and, and in advance and therefore spread the burden rather than put through what is effectively an accounting shock or a loss um, for that particular segment of, of, of income. Um, so actually, with one savings, you don't get that. The second thing I'd say is they're very much ahead of the curve in, in terms of their IRB models and, and submitting um, enough data to potentially put themselves in, in a better position uh, in future. So, you know, when you compare with the, with the bigger banks, it is, a, um, it is not a level playing field, actually. It, 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 the bigger banks have a huge amount of legacy issues and, mm. uh, and not trying to take names, but, you know, they've had their own share of scandals. Um, whereas something like Paragon does not have that. In fact, it has a relatively low level of gearing. It has a low level of non-performing loans, very low level of defaults. But the perception is, oh, well, if you lend to a professional buy, buy to that landlord, surely that's a problem. You're not going to be able to grow in future. You're going to have a whole range of companies potentially as they, and so many of them got incorporated going, going under. And in response, actually, you'll find that they are a um, reasonably conservative uh, bank who have done incredibly well from the, from, from, from the net interest margins. They actually had an upgrade quite recently. So analysts are probably sort of kind of wondering what to do with us in this one, because you don't really want to be too bold and, and, and upgrade it now. Uh, but we will hear from them shortly. And I, I suspect things will have cooled off a bit. Look, when you get high interest rates, a lot of volatility, the macro is not actually that exciting when you know, you, you, you put it all into perspective, you have 14 or 15 rates in a row, rate hikes. Um, one wonders, it's almost a, sort of a show me uh, the evidence before we kind of get 
interested. And, and for us, it's it's been a very steady dividend payer all the way through. It was also the first to come back on after the pandemic with an SPA group. So um, we want to sort of stick with it. And it's, a, it's, it's as I say, there's a long association there. And I, I have full faith in the, in the team that they will do the right things. You may well get a bit of volatility short term, but I think longer term, it's a much better business. Yeah, I think the banking sector, unfortunately, has, has, has suffered a bit on sentiment wise because there's sort of like grey haired, long in the tooth type investors like myself who suffer from PTSD from the uh, great financial crisis and uh, and therefore at the moment are just a bit nervous. But uh, anyway, moving on to another related area in the sort of real estate, but REITs in sort of like uh, box storage, we've got um, Big Yellow which serves um, consumers and retail and, and um, businesses with sort of like self-storage units outside their sort of houses and helps sort of businesses. And likewise, we have uh, Safe Store and the similar sort of thing. They're both trading at significant discounts to, uh, to, to book. How, what, what do you see here? Because obviously these must be really good income generators and they still seem to be increasing their like-for-like -like sales. And I think, I think London's doing okay, actually, in terms of, you know, sort of like site um, openings. That's correct. Well, both Big Yellow and Safe Store are very similar. Um, mm. Safe Store has a slight difference in that it, it kind of does have a history with the, the, the region of Paris. Um, it's also sort of slightly expanding into Europe now. Um, Big Yellow has actually done a placing relatively recently, yeah. a little over 100 million pounds. Mm. It's very unusual for that team to do a placing. And the reason they've done it is they don't like high gearing. They don't like the debt. Um, so if you if you look at the stats, they're actually sort of something like 17% geared on, on an EPRA and ad basis. And that's not high for a business in that sector at all. Um, what's more is this is this is all cash equity done at a very, very small discount to the market price. It was done very quickly. Um, and it's all for sort of um, capex into pipeline. So new assets. You see, if, if you believe that the, they have that ability to find these rare sites, get the planning, develop them in the correct way, and then gradually ramp up the occupancy towards 80%, which is give or take where both of them, both Safe Store and, and Big Yellow tend to sort of have their mature sites. And, and you know, because you're always going to get a degree of natural return. The 80% figure is actually very solid, very healthy, and incredibly cash generative. So it's an earnings accretive placing, which is, you know, again, um, highly unusual in this sector. Normally, there's sort of a, we'll let you know next year or in two years' time, um, once we've sort of invested the proceeds. But um, a, a very conservative team, again, um, and long-standing CEO. It's been a core holding for us and a very steady dividend pay. Yeah, and I think... Uh... A lot of the people, particularly on the sort of consumers and households, we just we carry on collecting things, don't we? We never get rid of them. So. We collect them, and, and there's also a, a sort of a, a smaller business element to it in terms of storage. So, you know, your inventory somewhere, man and van, um, comes to mind. And um, it, it does have a function, if you like, connected to GDP and transactional volumes and the housing. So maybe that's the, the flip side, which is why, you know, in a high interest rate environment, you think, okay, well, if the housing market's slowing, perhaps these businesses won't do well. But equally, you know, if you're not buying a house and you're you're renting somewhere before you move, then you may well end up staying for a few months longer than you initially thought. And that can be quite good for them in terms of extra revenues. Yeah, and their occupancy is still over 80%, isn't it? So they're not exactly empty, to say the least. Um, now, shifting sectors to the transport, um, Wing Canton. Um, now, this one has got uh, had a bit of a pension scheme, I think, but I guess it's probably benefited from uh, higher interest rates. And also one of its competitors, DX Group, seems to have got a, an acquisition um, bid from private equity. How, how do you look at this sort of sector and, and Wing Canton in particular? Because... I think it trades at still, I mean, you know, another one which is around about eight times PE and you think that looks, looks mispriced if there's, if there's M&A going off and consolidation in the sector. Indeed. Well, um, if I can say on the sector, I, I don't, I, maybe it's unusual to say this as well, but I really don't want this one getting taken over now. Um, <laughs> whatever premium you get, it's not going to be enough. And, and I say that uh, because really it's a business which is in transition. So I would much rather 
they build up their profits, they redeploy effectively the, the 20 million of free cash flow boost they're going to get, give or take, depending which model you look at. Um, and, and that's coming from the, the release of having sorted out their pension. Um, well, that's the one benefit I suppose you, you, you get from a high interest rate environment where the deficit is not a deficit, it's surplus. If you can do a transfer exercise, then you know, and agree it with the trustees, and then you get the boost. So October was really the last month where they made a contribution. And on a run rate basis over the next year, what you will see is a 20 million boost per annum, give or take. So um, that can be redeployed into, into earnings. And, um, and you know, we like that, as, even though we're dividend seekers, because we love it when, when a company says, oh, actually, we've got lots of ideas for earnings growth and we want to invest in the business, because that is the purest quality of, of dividend source that one can want. Um, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is go and pressure these companies to say, oh, give me a special dividend, because, you know, you've just had a bit of a boost. And, and we want the longevity of these businesses to continue. Yeah. What about um, sort of the, the debt level? How, what sort of like rules of thumb do you use in terms? Because I did notice when Canton, I mean, it's not particularly leveraged, but it's on about sort of 1.7, 1.7, 1.8 times EBITDA sort of, you know, leverage. Well, again, I look at both EBITDA and uh, net debt to net assets. And mm. the reason I do it as net assets rather than total is it's a bit more conservative on the, on the ratio. So I prefer having it at sub sort of two times EBITDA significantly below and in, on net debt to net assets or, or equity, if you like, um, uh, definitely be below 50%. Now, that's not true for every single company. On the whole, that would be right because you have to make some allowances for where the business is, the business model, have they made some acquisitions temporarily? And then, you know, in a year or two from now, if the deleverage is very fast because of cash flow and the businesses that they've invested in, then, then you know, that, that's something that we should tolerate. Yeah, and I guess it's probably also the sort of the interest cover, isn't it, to 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 watch out for? Because so if you go to the micro level, micro cap level, then you are seeing quite some, you know, pretty racy um, interest rates, sort of 10, 12, even 14 percent. I have seen sort of like, an, you know, convertible debt, this sort of stuff being put in, which means that you're. Your, your, your interest cover needs to be pretty much you need to have a pretty big interest cover, I guess. Yes, and and I look at the free cash flow. Um, mm. Really, you can you can look at EPS cover, uh, and and you can say, well, you know, isn't that comfortable? But really, if the free cash flow after your interest costs and your capex and your tax, your working capital changes, and yeah. maybe other cash absorption items is plenty. Then it gives us some comfort that actually that dividend is secure. Mm. Good. Okay. Well, again, just switching sectors to uh, life assurance and. Uh, sort of like you know corporate pensions because this could this chesnara which actually could be a sort of like help uh win canton with its pension to take it off its hands a win-win for both companies here is, I, I guess that's what you play is as sort of like one what you help with one what one business and the other one also benefits well chesnara is an interesting one because there has been a change of ceo there mm -hmm. and um it is a sort of consolidator of, of pensions if you like um they have a really good sort of foothold in, in the Netherlands. Um, and I would imagine that because both the CEO and the, the current FD, who has actually been there quite a long time, um, have a sort of a, a history. Uh, they, they come from Royal London and CEO actually was the, the sort of chief commercial officer with a remit for M&A. Mm. Uh, I think as that steps up, then you will see an increasing amount of sort of earnings creative deals that they do but again not one that is known to be um too aggressive on the gearing they, they don't like to lever up too much and i think they will effectively prove it out so it'll be bolt on acquisitions and then you get the dividend increases but again you know chesnara could actually be quite a nice fit for a much bigger company mm -hmm. uh, legal in general comes to mind but they had actually previously under the the, the, the old team, uh, I, I say, sort of exited the, uh, the Netherlands. But, you know, if you're doing the heavy lifting and you're on very good terms, the regulator and all the rest of it, um, well, you know, that might be the gold standard of how to do business in that region and could be a very sort of uh, cherished asset, if I can put it like that. Yeah. And just on that model of sort of like, you know, buying sort of legacy, cor legacy corporate pensions, is, is this sort of the idea that, let's say, somebody like Wincanton or, I don't know, GKN or any of these kind of guys, they basically, they hand you the the pension that they have, uh, at, which is valued, or they pay you effectively at a much lower interest rate. So it's got more assets, i.e. such so as the actuarial valuation, but then yours, your specialist 
sort of investment manager and insurer and you you effectively then can with the assets that you, you then use you know to invest in they can generate you a higher return than you would get on a say on an annuity which is what you're being paid for so you you, you effectively arbitrage that spread i i think in in both cases the the important thing is that the pensioners are taken care of properly mm. and this is not a sort of you know clandestine deal where one person or one entity has sort of got the better of the other yeah. in a very temporary phenomenon of, of higher interest rates. I think it is something where perhaps actually the, the, um, the cash flows are such that when the bot is made whole, it's something that you don't want to yes. administration on, you yeah. don't want on the burden because it's a distraction for, for management. And, and at that point, you actually hand it on to a specialist who has the benefit of being able to do all of that already in place with the infrastructure and can actually give you the benefits of maybe say operational leverage, you know, because it's just another book that they're managing as it were. So that I think that's the way I would think about it. Um, but yes, of course, you know, if, if rates are continuously volatile, then that requires more more management of, of that particular pension and, and quite rightly so actually. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, we've gone through a number of um, sectors, and one thing which is sort of coming out, and we've got a few others as well. Sort of like we've had a lot of M and A, and we've had some more th- th- sort of this week. Is that sort of like a continuing feature? And and there's not only th- of that of sort of like you've had a lot of sort of acquisitions by sort of private equity or trade buyers, but also we've had a very moribund sort of like you know uh, IPO market certainly in in the UK. In fact, we've, we've only had one, which is cab payments, which has <laughs> got totally taken to clubs, which does seem as though it's a sort of strange one in terms of there is outside capital willing to deploy it into listed companies to take them off at low valuations but there's very few ipos coming on the market which i guess is a reflection of the vendors yes. just not not wanting to to hit at a lower price i guess yes it's 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 that and i think there is a actually there is one uh, other one in the insurance sector which um, may well have been publicly announced now uh, so i think i think watch that space and, and that could be quite an interesting um, sort of vehicle that's doing something slightly different. Uh, we aren't involved with it mm-hmm. at this stage, but I think when it does start paying a dividend, it could be quite a good one um, because it's really sort of quite uncorrelated to the rest of the sector yeah. and gives you a sort of slight play into some of the Lloyd's um, schemes. But uh, look, IPOs, MA, all of that is a, a sort of reflection of where valuations are. If you're a vendor, you don't want to sell cheap. Yeah. Uh, Equally, if you're a buyer, you've got lots of choice. So, you know, um, in this market, you know, why should I put my capital at risk if I know another team where they're already paying a dividend, for instance, and they've got a track record of not letting you down and guiding conservatively, you know, I I would rather be there. There's an opportunity cost, basically what I'm saying. So tying up our shareholders' capital for nine months before, you know, I'd say nine months because you'd be listed for six months and you'd pay one third of your full year dividend three months later after reporting quite a long time to wait, you know, quite quite a bit could happen between now and then. So um, you've got to be really quite sure and it has to be attractively priced, I think, in this current cycle. And, and maybe that's why the pipeline of IPOs is a bit, a bit slower. But again, that does pick up um, over time. And, and if I could twist it around a little bit, if you were a private equity player and you were looking to sort of, you know, sell your asset, um, you know, we, we do have yeah. things in, in the likes of 3i. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that straight away either. You know, so if, if you're getting the valuations based on your own growth, uh, take 3i's biggest asset, which is the action uh, group. It's, it's, it's a discount retailer. Mm. That's over 60% of its now and it's been growing. It's been growing. It's even dark, something like 25, 30%. Um, mm. And it's got very high margins and it's, it's been doing it time and time again. So while you've still got the growth curve, why would you sell it today? You know, you might as well wait. And, and when you're maybe three, four, five years into the journey from here, you would consider a much bigger number, a much bigger valuation for it. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking at the, yeah, you're right. I mean, three I, it's on a valuation or well, PE ratio. I know, I know you can't really use it, but it's sort of like less than six at the moment. So. Exactly right, yeah. And again, you know, you can't quite sort of say, well, the value of uh, the other assets aren't what they are because actually they own over 20% of three I infrastructure as well which is just short a billion pounds in, in value. So again, that's been performing actually quite well and trades at a discount. We have a small holding in that just for full disclosure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they've got some tremendous assets, things like Global Exchange, which is effectively a, a, a sort of a network of, of subsea cables. And, and that's a play into, into data center growth. So you know, I'm just giving you one example there, yeah. but 
why should that trade on a discount to NAV when actually it should be on potentially a premium to NAV? It continues to profit generation is great. They had a very good capital market stage just a few weeks ago, um, which I attended, and um, I came away re reasonably impressed, actually. Yeah, and also I think um, more broadly, it's good, very good anecdotal evidence. All of this sort of the M and A, the IPO, the PE, you know, sort of like the PE activity and and three I, what you said earlier on, i.e., such so the valuations actually are attractive if you look at it on a long term view, simply because you, because all of those, you know, with the lack of IPOs, the heavy M and A, and the undervaluation of sort of things like three I. And their and the behaviour about <clears throat> bringing new you know the new 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 companies to market that that all implies it's all consistent with your view and my view that actually there's a lot of good value on small and mid caps no doubt about it <laughs> no doubt about it I think there's good value in absolute terms you, mm. you, while some some of these stocks may yeah. be trading single digit fees they're also trading on discounts to their peer group and then they're just trading on discounts on top so you could say there's a double discount mm. to the larger companies and indeed to some of the overseas companies so you know there are there's always been a bit of a gap between the uk and the us and that's due to sector and maybe there's more tech in the us and so on but even if you adjust all of that there's still a big discount if you look at the the latest note that's come out from from family Gordon's chief economist mm. uh, again that's a, that's another source that sort of just highlights that uh, that massive gap there's sort of 17 18 percent discount to, to yeah. what what it should be you know, so, so it's, it's more than normal is what we're seeing. Yeah. Another one which is related to uh, to 3i, as you've got in your portfolio, is Intermediate Capital Group, which is sort of like a fixed income asset manager stroke. It does a bit of mezzanine debt, I think, in, across sort of the UK, well, Asia Pac and Europe, et cetera. Do you want to take us through this one? Because, um, again, it's cheap and it's trading at less than 12 times PE. Yes, this is unfortunately one of those where when you're a high beta financial and you're a private debt manager rather than private yeah. debt manager, you are going to get affected by what happens to bond yields and perception of your ability to raise funds. What attracted us to this one was initially it was a relatively less well-known business, whereas Blackstone may be the, the giant in the space. Um, when it came to sort of raising funds for various strategies, they would have to put in their own capital. And, and then alongside there would be a fundraise, which maybe would encourage outside investors to come in. But as they got bigger, they actually found that vintages were getting dovetailed by third-party investors. So, you know, you could you could get fees on committed capital for seven to eight years, which gave them tremendous visibility. But as you approach, say, year seven, um, you'd get a new vintage, the same strategy rising, and then the same investors would roll over into that. And you wouldn't actually need to put that much in from your own balance sheet. So there's this separation between investment company and fund management company. And you'd be getting the fees as a fund manager and your investment company didn't actually have to invest as much. So even though they've still got a two and a half billion, give or take, in euros, um, a, a sort of a balance sheet on the, the investment company side, it's the fund management company where the fees continues to grow. Now, one would have thought that actually how, how are you going to be doing your fundraising? You know, you can't possibly raise any funds in this environment. And they have actually been incredibly successful. They've, they've they raised something like two and a half billion quite recently. Uh, for one of their actually three strategies across the board so the, the target is 10 billion can they do it we'll see but um so far so good the run rate's absolutely on track mm. yeah well i mean there's been a huge interest hasn't there from investors into private credit um rather than sort of private equity so uh yeah i mean i think yeah the, the wind is definitely on, on their backs to say the least now switching um sectors to sort of like uh, resources and oil let's start off with um diversified energy which sort of like has i think most of its resources sort of gas fields out in sort of shale gas fields out in the u.s into the appalachian um, area do you want to take us through uh, this one because first of all why have you decided to go sort of like more gas rather than sort of like oil um and also you know obviously why have you gone to the u.s um you know in, rather than sort of like elsewhere in the world well, I think when they first came to market, we quite liked what they were trying to do, which was it was in the Appalachian region. Um, and it was very different. It was quite a sort of uncorrelated asset to anything else that we would have had here in the UK. Um, the buy and build story has continued. And I think just, again, you know, if, if to, to balance it so that I'm not just talking my own book on, on that one, it does have gearing. Um, but what they're trying to prove out is to say, look, there's a whole bunch of 
non-operational assets that we've acquired over time that we haven't developed as yet. Um, while you've got a, a long tail of old wells that the majors don't want that we can decommission in line with the regulations and all the rest of it and actually even improve the life of well in some cases, that cash flow is just on, on one side. And then there's the undeveloped acreage which they can sell. And they are selling them quite well. They've, they've actually proved that up quite recently. They've done two or three sales. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do more now. There's a risk valuation and an unrisk valuation. And if you believe it, that's probably $500 million worth of, of value sitting there. So that can be quite significant. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's the cash flow. The longer you wait and the more debt you pay down, um, then you know the business looks in, in better shape. Now, gas prices have been very volatile. They were sort of... Mm. Six dollars at one point, there's more like sort of three and a half dollars now. And actually that's perfectly fine for them because they're a low-cost producer. It's less about exploration for them, much more about just managing what's already there. They know what's there. Yeah. Is these wells are not trying to sort of increase production ever more or, or make a big fine so that exploration risk doesn't exist. It's much more about can you manage the, the rate of decline, which is already actually flattened out. Um, and, and and that's what that's what uh, diversified was really for us. It was a high yield play, quite lowly rated, and they they started doing share buybacks as well. So I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, and there is actually M and A. Admittedly, it's on a sort of like the slightly a bigger companies, but sort of you know Chevron and and Hess, I think, and Pioneer and uh, Exxon. So they'll they'll probably be consolidated into the the lower levels as well. I'm I'm guessing. It's what I what I didn't say was that you know with with gas there was also from the perspective of, of having something different to oil, um, a, a bit of an attraction there that was considered relatively cleaner. So, so that was the other thing that we liked about it. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, it's a transition um, fuel, isn't it, for the uh, to move to decarbonisation, as you as you point out. Good. OK, well, just moving now to sort of industrial metals and commodities. Let's start off with Kenmare Resources, which I think is a, um, it's a Mozambique titanium um, miner. And first of all, what's the attraction of titanium? And the second one, what's the attraction of Mozambique? <laughs> well, two big questions. Um, I think with, with um, Kenmare, what I would say is that the region should not be a um, reason not to invest. Okay? Yeah. Because when it comes to resources, as, as one of my colleagues used to say, actually not, nothing is completely safe. And, mm. and look at the UK and, and yeah. the UK. Okay, well, we can have retrospective taxation in the North Sea. Well, you yeah. know, or there's been talk of it. So um, Mozambique in itself, actually, I, I, I remember another play called Cove Energy many, many years ago when I used to work with Giles in the Special Situations Fund mm. in there. And it was the first time they found gas there, and, and it was huge. Um, in fact, I remember speaking to a very senior person at Shell at the time, and he said um, that they were absolutely astounded at the size of that discovery. I think it was something like 2 TCF at the time, which was mm -hmm. unheard for that region. But bringing it back to Kenme, look, it is a, um, a story currently where the first half production of Ilmenite was, was a bit weaker, okay? Um, part of that was also led by customers effectively saying, not yet. Um, so that is a function of the global economy. And then the second half is expected to be much, much stronger. So cash flows, it's got net cash, on top of that, uh, but cash flows will get better. It does cover its dividend twice um, on, on forecasts and various models. And um, it, it, it is ultimately a, a GDP play, you could argue, but you know, equally, these are these are all sort of materials that are very high in demand, whether it's for, for coatings or whether it's, it's, it's for right. cosmetics. Ultimately, it's, it's, um, it's a rare asset, if I can put it like that. Right. Okay. And it's e it's easy to get the money out of Mozambique, is it? I mean, presumably they sell the titanium on dollar terms, isn't it? Presumably, I don't know, but it's then getting it into shareholders' hands through dividends. So far, so good. They have been paying it, and and I think they have their mechanisms. But I don't think it's easy to get money out or cross border in in any place. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I won't won't pretend that it's it's you know straightforward for them, but. Um, Look, with all these commodity plays, they are volatile, they are smaller companies, but we take comfort in the fact that they've got strong balance sheets and the cash flows support them. So even at its current levels, they are in quite good shape. Yeah. Let's move on, on the same area, but it actually does royalties. Is, is, is Ecora Resources, which uh, 
has got sort of like royalty streams, I think, on iron ore and copper and gold, uranium and other commodities. I guess this is a slightly safer business model because it's just collecting income from multiple different locations and, and is not dependent on any one particular commodity or what any one particular mine. That's one that's going through a huge transition, if I can put it like that. Mm. Um, while the royalty model is incredibly attractive to us because you effectively don't have to do much. You leave the, the big sort of miners and the majors to operate and when they get into your block and, and their particular one for coal royalties was Kestrel. Mm. Uh, so when when you have the, the likes of a Rio Tinto operating there, they will essentially send you the, the royalties because it's all very clearly agreed. But equally, if they move away, as they have done recently, then you, know, you don't get paid. And, and you have to wait till they come back onto the, your part of the acreage. Now, those decisions are slightly independent. You can't, as a, a as equal as a small business, go and start, sort of tell the miners when to mine where and, and how much. But there is a certain method, and I think the expectation is in this second half, actually in the last quarter even, they are going to be potentially coming back into the acreage for Kestrel. The, the bigger news for us really is, is how they transition. And I think this is where I feel slightly sorry for the company because it's it's not one where investors have been perhaps giving the benefit of doubt to patients um, to let the company transition. So as Kestrel and its royalties because of the end of my uh, life, which is which is due, um, and you know, as those earnings start to deplete, it actually screens very badly, right? Because you're you're getting earnings, lower cash. However, they had a super normal year previously when commodity prices were high, and they are redeploying that into other cleaner uh, fuels, if you like, and cleaner materials, so the likes of cobalt, for instance, where they will get royalties. And actually, that's quite exciting because it is really a, a, a material in terms of the, the future of batteries, uh, a very key component for it. And, yeah. and they will do other, other such, I think, quite clever deals, but they buy carefully. Um, it is it is a discipline management team, and I think we just have to sort of slightly watch that one. Um, even with the dividends, maybe they will be sort of slightly up and down, but in the long run, I think there's plenty of value in that. And as you say, you know, you, you have a royalty model where you have some degree of visibility because eventually those blocks will get mined and you will get the cash flows. And in a way, you don't want everything done too quickly either, especially if commodity, commodity prices are coming off. Yeah, no, you're right. And uh, just to point out, Harlex investors, you've got Ken Moyer on a sort of less than four times PE, and you've got uh, Ecora on about seven and a half times PE. So yeah, they're pretty much uh, it's priced. Fairly typical with, with both of those stocks where they're sort of single digit PE and quite high yields, actually. Yeah. It, just in talking about game more broadly about sort of like, you know, the way you run the fund, et cetera, where, when required, do you sort of like, you know, quietly sort of like point management in the right direction you know not activists openly obviously but sort of like uh you know sort of tr try and shift them into you know sort of like um, shareholder value creating um sort of activities we're not really activists um no. i have to be clear about that but yeah when we are asked for an opinion um on you know do you think this would be a good idea strategically and it's mm. generally quite top down then we will we will share that. Um, I think one one topic which kind of comes up quite a bit is, is about share buybacks mm. and how do we feel about that. And I think there is a place for share buybacks. For instance, uh, you know if your if your share price is is absolutely cratering for no particular reason, mm. and you you think well rather than go and buy something else, actually we know our business. We can we can put a bit of surplus capital or cash flow into that buy back some of the shares, you don't pay much of a dividend on it, and that's fine. I think where I would caution teams is to say, don't do it for the sake of it um, and at the cost of your other opportunities. So if you've already made a commitment to pay a dividend or you think that there's a very good um, earnings creative investment somewhere, and that might be organic, do that first. And you know, let, let the stock market sort out the share price over time. That will happen. But just focus on the operations and the earnings. That's much more important. Um, and I, I think in, in the end, that's probably the right thing because you can only do so much in terms of share buybacks. What happens once you've yeah. spent the 50 million or whatever it is that you'd allocated to it? Can you do it next year? Can you do it the year after? Because, you know, that aspect of the market being irrational may carry on for much longer than they can stay liquid. Yeah, you're right. And also, it just distracts, doesn't it, management teams, their focus. I mean, 
you've got a plethora of one the big sort of mega caps in the states apple and you had ibm and they were just like perpetual share buyback guys at whatever value you know much higher than maybe the intrinsic worth of the shares i'm i'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because actually it is more of an american phenomenon the share buyback and i don't want to be too skeptical but if you if you dig deeper you'll find there is a degree of correlation between management incentives or the <laughs> Yes, and, and share buybacks. It's not always but you have to really. <laughs> yes, but a lot of financial engineering, isn't there, on on adjusting that on adjusted EPS to say the least. <laughs> Uh, now another one which is um, is, is a sort of sector that's been battered actually largely almost from the great financial crisis is the contractors and you've got one which is um, Morgan uh, Sindel which trades on again eight times PE uh, good strong balance sheet it's got slim margins but I think a lot of investors are still having this perhaps wrong perception of uh, PTSD of you know things like Carillion and all these other ones contractors what's what's the sort of invest, investment case with um, with Morgan Sindel look we we um, actually were very careful with Morgan Sindel it took certainly multiple meetings before we we mm. could get comfortable with the idea that this really was a net cash position on average all the way through the year yeah. whereas so many companies will show you a sort of a cash harvest in the fourth quarter or even right yeah. towards the end of their results reporting date. This is one where it really is truly a net cash position all the way. And, and I think from that perspective, they must now be beginning to think about how can they be a beneficiary of high interest rates sitting on that cash pile because they don't want to do any big M&A. Mm -hmm. um, they, they do see it as truly surplus. And a big chunk of that, of course, will go into sort of working capital and replenishing various projects and the bonding and what have you. But they have an order book, which is growing. They've done incredibly well from the fit out business, which is, again, slightly counter to what one might think. But with all the way building regulations, environmental standards have gone, offices have to change the way they're sort of they're, they're built. And indeed, actually, even if you have some regional differences, they seem to be the ones that are winning share. Um, and it's again very conservatively run. So uh, but Morgan Sindel absolutely sort of is one alongside, I would say, maybe even Gallup Drive, where yeah. not that's got a negative enterprise value. So, you know, that's that enterprise value, meaning that the, the yeah. net position covers the market cap. Uh, again, so that, if that is an example of a cheap stock, you know, I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I totally get it. And, uh, I think uh, certainly with uh, with Morgan Sindel and with Gallifer Try, they've moved away from these sort of fixed price contracts, haven't they? They're sort of more cost plus. So if they do get in materials inflation, then that that that's automatically trans you know transferred. And also, I presume on on wage inflation for long term projects, it gives them that. That's, yes, that's been the learning, hasn't it? And I think yeah. you mentioned Carillion, and this is where moving away from fixed price contracts. It's also true for Wincanton. They've learned that, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't go and tie yourself up and leave yourself hostage fortune because you want to be actually master of your own destiny. So yes, if you're confident that you can manage your costs, great. But, you know, equally, if there's a bit of variability in a, in a world where actually things are quite volatile still. All the cooling, which, which you know, it's still going off a high level. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to take the risk? Much better just to focus on what you can do and what you can control. And I think this is, this is where the, the good companies are uh, you know, using their management skills to negotiate appropriately. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and I think it's also going to be an industry where the strong get stronger because if we do see sort of like a, a limited amount of, or less work being put forward, even though it's obviously infrastructure is still very important in the UK, but if it's, it's, it'll go to those companies that have the balance sheet, the bulletproof balance sheets who can actually uh, give confidence to the, to the clients that they're going to continue, they're going to do these projects and complete them on time. Exactly. So and survive through through the next cycle yeah. having to sort of come back with cap in hand for a right issue yeah yeah okay well now just looking a bit slightly smaller mcfarlane which does sort of like packaging across a number of its industries sort of electronics industrial but also fmcg what sort of like um drives you into this because obviously there's there's the boost secular growth in sort of like getting more environmentally friendly packaging but obviously all things online sort of retail as um as has come off its high its sugar high from uh, two years ago it, it's a specialist packaging business so it's, it's yeah very much into protective packaging, if I can put it like that. And their model is, again, this is a team that has been excellent at, at sort of 
under promising and over delivering very conservative um they their model is very much a buy and build one so they will they will typically only pay five to six times even down for a business mm -hmm. and they will do it gradually they, they integrate they buy businesses where the culture is similar to their own um and it, it is interesting in terms of the dynamic as well you know they, they work with the likes of the ds smith and smurf and capo um and it's fairly international actually so mm -hmm. It's not sort of dependent on one sector only, whether it's industrial, healthcare, retail, it's, it's kind of exposed to quite a few different things. Yeah. How much pricing power does it have in terms of, is, is it, when you say it's more of a sort of like protective packaging, does that give it the specialization to have it, they can charge a premium because cardboard boxes are pretty cheap around here in Birmingham. Yes. It's, it's not the, it's not corrugated packaging. Uh, okay way that you know you might get it in an Amazon box it's, it's not quite that and actually that may well have very good packaging prices as well mm. uh, this is this is much more about design and mm. sort of working with the client at the very outset how you want to present the product that's in it so um, this may not be the client but the example um, hopefully holds uh, the likes of a Nike or a, or a luxury product might say fine you know we want this to look and feel like it should in keeping with with actually what the brand stands for yeah. so it's that input and then the ability to source and deliver it consistently you know it's one thing doing it on a design on a computer graphic screen and showing a prototype can you do it in bulk for you know five thousand items for instance so so i think it's, it's that and, and you know to do it consistently over time it's that reliability that does command the pricing power but look with all of these things there is a lag usually you know if you add your input cost inflation you're not going to recover it immediately. It does take a while to get it back. Yeah, oh, and yeah, I'm with you. I mean, it comes down to that classic sort of marketing mix, isn't it? Of the if you have a look at the big FMCG guys, it was always price promotion, um, and uh, was it was a price promotion? Uh, I can't remember something else, and then and then packaging was always one as well, where you sort of like you know, and and it sort of chimes with their. Um, uh, EBIT, EBIT margins, which are about 9%. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, I mean, also, I, would, I should probably say that there is an element of the um, environmental um, expectation there. Yeah. You can show that it's from a traceable material. And, you know, have you done it to the extent that it's lighter in terms of the overall package? Has that saved your client cash? So yeah. if you can do that, uh, there is an element of sharing that can be done. You know, and, and yes, you might charge a higher price on occasion, but if everyone's winning, then you know, the client's happy to pay that. Yeah, the other one was place. I was just trying to remember it. You're because you want you want your packaging to, to stand out from the place on the shelf. But anyway, let's move on. I was getting confused. Um, to uh, to pets at home now. This one has been a perennial high performer up up until recently. Um, it does. It's a retail of obviously all sort of like you know companion animal type um, products and um, uh, toys and all this sort of stuff. But also has a vet uh, business as well. And the M the M the CMA. The Competition Markets Authority has uh, decided to open up an investigation across the whole industry of vet practices. It's hit more the other operators, I think, uh, and I can't. There's one which has springs C to mind. Um, CVS potentially. But yeah, that's it. CVS, that's the one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, what, what's your view on 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 uh, pets for home? Because again, again it's uh, it's come off, and uh, it should have a long runway ahead in terms of you know all the pets that people took on during the downturn. Yes, well, and also COVID, I, I would say that um, yeah. we had a bit of fear because uh, there were people in the office even saying, oh, you know, what what if they go hand the pets back to a kennel and you yeah. know, so on and because now they're all going back to work and maybe they're not as in love with their pets after all. But actually, it's it's not been the case. Um, we haven't seen or heard of, of that kind of trend. And there is a, there's quite a bit in, in the Pets at Home story, actually. There's there's the increase in terms of online. That's, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. The second is that the vet side is, is really, at this stage, only 30% of, um, of operating income. And, and, you know, it may well grow, but equally, should there be any negative outcome, which we don't expect from the, the CMA, um, then, you know, it is limited to that. I should probably add that, look, what the CMA is doing is absolutely right, is to, to look at what kind of information is being provided on um, from the, 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 the vets and, and from these pet care providers, because I think the consumer definitely should be better informed and they deserve to know what they're paying for and what choices they have. And I think it's, it's just increasing that transparency. Now, um, no one knows the outcomes yet, but I think what will happen is, is you'll find that and this is the view of the analysts that, that you know sort of 
cover the stock. Um, what will probably happen is that there will be some kind of a remedial uh, basis or standard where all uh, providers are expected to show the same information. And I, and I think the good companies will welcome that. You know, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, so it has it has uh, benefits from bulk purchasing. It, it has scale. It is integrated, and it is both a a vet and a um, a retailer. So so that is something that one needs to be aware of. Um, but yes, we we haven't actually seen um, any sort of real downturn, as it were, that you know any big drop off in, in the cliff. If anything, as a result of the the larger number of puppies and kittens and so on, what happens is there is a life cycle um, for how um, often maybe the, the pet owner will come in. And, and initially it's to get all the bedding and the, the basics to, to get the um, uh, to get the bed comfortable. But then in between what will happen is, is there's a sort of a, a bell curve, you know, it, it kind of, an inverted bell curve if you like. So it starts high and then switches off a bit and then ticks, ticks up again. And, and the reason for that is obviously as the pet gets older, then it needs more care and needs more medication and so on. And, and so you kind of know as each year goes on that there is going to be a sort of a transition for that pet population into that higher part of the curve. And it's actually quite exciting because you get bigger synergies and you hopefully also improve the care and the offering for the pet owner. So it's not, it's not all about just, you know, sort of trying to charge the high, highest price possible. It's also about improving and showing innovation, which is, I think, one of the things that CMA is very interested in. Last one, then. We've got um, Bloomberry Publishing. Now, I remember coming coming across this stock about 20 years ago, and it was uh, it was run by sort of like, uh, I think it was Nigel Newton back then, who's the sort of like the, the Harry Potter whiz kid of all things sort of like digital, well, publishing for, for authors, but uh, obviously owns that franchise for, uh, for Harry Potter. What's your latest on this one? Because it seems to have gone really strength for strength, really. Generates lots of cash and uh, no, keeps I'm knocking the numbers out. I'm if you hold that thought, I'm just going to get up and get a glass of water. And that yeah, might, please do. Yeah, I'm going to switch the, the 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 definition back to where it should be. Oh, there we go. It's back. Okay. Yeah, um, got it. It's perfect again. Here's my water. Okay, right. Um, Bloomsby Publishing. Yes, look, that's been, I think, one of our sleep at night stories, in, yeah. in the, the sense that uh, here's a team where. They have a real passion for what they do. They have, I can put it like this, a collection of authors who are really coming into their own, whether it's Sarah J. Mass, um, you know, or, or indeed Catherine Rundle. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of books being sold by them is on the up. And therefore, it's not just about Harry Potter. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when you do get a when you do get a sort of a, a, a bump up, if you like, in in uh, either a, uh, a a reprint or if you like sort of you know some kind of an anniversary edition um even a film uh, which is related to one of their books what happens is the, the back catalog gets a boost and and that's sitting there it's quite high margin for them the other side of the story is really this um idea of sort of the the, the digital uh, and the online push and and you've got sort of the consumer versus the non-consumer in fact i'm going to be seeing those republishing later today so, so I'll, I'll get a much more detailed update but in the meantime, um, you're getting sort of double digit revenue growth in, in specific divisions where perhaps you wouldn't have quite expected it. Um, the academic and publishing side sort of gets subscription revenues. And again, if you get sort of the likes of a, a library in the States, for instance, taking on a huge catalog of, of call it educational volumes and titles, you know, that's not just going to be for three months. It's it's actually available to all. And it's, it's effectively like a license revenue that, you know, a much higher quality source of earnings. So you could say that something like Bloomsbury should be trading on a on an informer type um, multiple. And, 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 you know, that that would mean that really it's on sort of, it's really only on half the multiple it should be. Yeah, yeah. Another one actually, it's just in the portfolio, I just noticed is Wilmington, which does sort of, you know, on the digital side, digital information, but not obviously for consumers, mainly for sort of like, you know, businesses, financial services, accountancy, healthcare, but it's sort of like the regulatory stuff. This one is, is seems to be again doing really well and could well seems to be a, a potential beneficiary of AI, of, of AI going forward. Because it, it, it is that correct in terms of it controls its own data and therefore can use it. You're you're right about the data. There's also an element of um, compliance and training. Um, yeah, 
again, in terms of the end sectors, it's, it covers finance as well. Mm. But there is an overlap. So you're right to move from, from Bloomsbury to, to, to Wilmington because there is an overlap. There, there's the intelligence side and then there's the data side. And again, uh, you know, should it be more in tune with the keeping of multiple that, you know, Relex or Informer had, perhaps? Mm. Um, but it does have that smaller company discount attached to it, which seems highly unfair given that it's actually improving and growing quite nicely. Yeah, Again, it's got it's got a rock. Both through. got rock solid balance sheets as well, haven't they? Net cash, yeah. Both of them have got net cash, so you know, looking very strong indeed and, and growing. Right? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. Okay, brilliant. Well, it looks as though we've got a great collection there for investors to to run through. All sort of like you know good value stocks with with secular with lots of them with good secular strong growth what would be the sort of the um sort of classic mistakes for investors at this point in the sort of the cycle to avoid going forward you would you would you say because you know you've got a very sensible long-term garp site strategy but things to to make sure you don't you know, try and avoid anyway at this moment given the elevated risks well i think it's um it's easy to get to sort of um, sucked into a trend, you know, yeah. sort of say, oh, well, don't want to invest in that sector because it hasn't done well so far. Well, those things change. And the other, other thing I would say is, you know, to try and avoid crystallizing losses because mm -hmm. you can't regret that down the road. So unless there's a, an urgent need to really get out something or there's some piece of information that changes your view on, on a story, um, you know, perhaps a bit of patience is required. For, for me, the most important thing right now is really the attitude. And, and there's been so much doom and gloom. And everyone's been so negative. Really, I think a bit of positivity is required because things aren't as bad as, as maybe they seem. Yeah, no, I would agree. Uh, actually, it was funny on that one. I spoke to... Uh... Um, to Martin Gilbert earlier in the week, and he said there's so much value in small and mid caps that uh, as long as you've got a two year time horizon, you should do really well. Well, also on that point, if you if you go back into the history of, of performance, small cap versus large cap, and and the, the numerous smaller companies index presentation that's done once a year, there's a fantastic chart in there which shows you that actually over the long term, smaller companies do outperform the long the, the larger counterparts in every region. Really. Yeah. So in every list region over the last fifty years, that's been true. And it's if, if you know if, if you think that it's it's probably due a bounce now because there's been such a disconnect. This is possibly one of the times where the delta, if you like, between the larger companies and say the FTSE 250, you know, even now, has never really been wider. And, and and you know, yes, they should trade differently, but not this differently, and not for this long. So at some point, you get a sort of a mean reversion. It may not close immediately, but certainly the direction is due. Yeah, well, that's a good positive point uh, to end it. Uh, and, uh, thanks very much, Sid, and look forward to uh, touching base again in about six months' time. Thanks a lot, Paul. All the best to you. Thanks.